any of the action, well, never fear. That's why we're here. We're going green now. ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports, presents exclusive coverage of the $50 million NHRA Powerade Drag Racing Series. Today, from Firebird International Raceway in Phoenix, Arizona, it's the final eliminations of the 19th running of the Checker, Shucks, Craig, and Nationals. And Martin Reed, along with Mike Dunn, Bill Stevens, Dave Brief, and Parker Johnstone, glad you're with us. If you missed any of the earlier action today on ESPN, never fear. We have got it all for you. In fact, let's start it off right now as we pick up round one of Top Fuel. Here's the way it started out with John Smith and Doug Herbert. Smith in the left lane takes the win in a 5.07. It wasn't pretty, but Herbert was a little worse, a 5.27. Rhonda Hartman did not qualify, but she was happy for her husband. That brought Jim Head and Corey McLennathan to the line. Head was in the unpreferred right lane, but Head runs a 465. Corey has problems, slows to a 530, and Head moves into second round. Then it was Daryl Russell, left lane. David Bach in the right lane. Russell goes 462 at 318. Baca could only manage a 475. Then it was Larry Dixon and Melanie Troxell. Dixon, 463. You can see Melanie had all kinds of problems. She had to get out of it. Don says, mm, not as quick as we wanted, but okay, we're down the track. Brandon Bernstein, he was alongside of Mike Strasburg. He goes 459 at 323, leaves Mike behind, and Kenny says, yeah, we can live with that. Good first round. IHRA champion Clay Milliken in the left lane against the former IHRA champ Paul Romine. 459, 315 as Clay made easy pickets of Romine. On board with Tony Schumacher in the Army of One, Bruce Litton over in the other lane. Litton was first off the line, but Shu left him. 459 and 320 to a 479 for Bruce Litton. And then rounding out top field, Doug Coletta, number one qualifier. Remember, he went out first round two weeks ago at Pomona, not this time. 453. 324 Kalita thundered through round number one. Here's the wave, the ladder shapes up. Lane choice goes to the man with the arrow. It'll be Kalita and Milliken on the left side. That's right, Milliken with the lane choice over Larry Dixon, Brandon Bernstein, and Tony Schumacher on the right side. Now, what about Funny Guard? Well, let's show you what happened there in round number one. Frank Pedragon and Dale Creasy. Frank at the KN Filters Machine. He goes 504. Wasn't very pretty again, but Creasy had more problems going a 510 and leaving very late on the tree. Next up was Bob Gilbertson in the left lane, Johnny Gray in the right, and it was Gilbertson 493 to a 494 in a great drag race, 312 miles an hour for Bob Gilbertson. What about Tony Pedregon, the points leader? Took care of Scotty Cannon easily, 487 to a 505, and he was 318 miles an hour. John Medlin says, uh-huh, we'll take that number. Then it was Gary Densham. Would Team Force go two for two? Bruce Pedregon was over in the other lane, and yep, it was all Gary. 485, 289 miles an hour. And that would leave the boss, John Force, qualified number three. He was up against Dean Scusa. Scusa nailed him twice in first round last year, but not this time. 482 to a 491. John goes 320 miles an hour. What about Whit Bazemore, left lane against Tommy Johnson Jr.? Good drag race here, 486 to a 489. Whit goes 320 miles an hour in the process. Bazemore will meet Force in round number two. Gary Selzy, Dell Worship. Selzy gives Team Schumacher its second representative into the second round, 483 at 318 miles an hour. And then it was Ron Capps. Tommy Johnson already out here, but he takes care of Tom Wilkerson, a 5.06, although it wasn't real great. He was there at 258 miles an hour. Take a look at the ladder, and you can see that Tony Pedregon, Bob Gilbertson have the lane choice there, and Selsey and Force over on the right side. Now let's turn our attention to Pro Stock in first round, and things started off bad for Scott Jeffrey. Not only does he go red, but watch what happens just after the finish line as he locks the brakes just long enough to send the car violently across the lane and hard into the wall. 
boy, Scott Jeffrey and I went for a wild ride there. Looked like what happened is the chute didn't come out. He got on the brakes a little too hard. The car moved to the left, and then he overcorrected to the right and went head on into that wall. Very hard hit. Now, if you look at it from this angle, like right at this point right here, if you had presence of mind, you'd want to just try to spin that thing out and scrub off some speed. But as a drag racer, I mean, that's easier said than done because basically you're just trying to get that thing stopped, and your first reaction is always to just try to correct any time that thing starts going sideways. More on Scott's condition in a moment. Now, Jake Coughlin, you're on board. He gets the benefit of Alan Johnson going red. You can see on the upper left-hand corner of the screen, Jed goes 688 at 200 miles an hour to advance into second round action. What about Mark Powell? He hasn't won in over a year, not even a single round. Well, he did now, 689. Terry Adams fades in the distance, 199 miles an hour. Mark Powell, Bob Glidden as his tuner, Bill Grumpy Jenkins with the power. Then it's Troy Coughlin and Greg Stanfield. And it's 686 at 200 miles an hour, and Troy joins brother Jeg in second round competition. Next up, it would be Kirk Johnson and Daryl Alderman. And it was Kirk cutting the better light, running the better ET. 685 at 201 to Daryl's 686, also at 201 miles an hour. Then Ron Krischer for the second race in a row. He goes red, hands Greg Anderson the victory, 685, 201 for Greg. Then Jim Yates and Warren Johnson. Eight championships between them. Look at the light by Yates, a 006. He runs a 688 through a quicker but losing 687. Whole shot win for Jim Yates. And then it was Bruce Allen and Tom Martino. Number one qualifier, Bruce Allen, new track record. 684 on this run to a 690, never in doubt, as Bruce moves on to second round competition. Take a look at the ladder. The arrow indicates who's got the lane choice. Bruce Allen and Kirk Johnson on the left side. Over on the right, it'll be Jake Coughlin and Greg Anderson. Now, let's give you the update on Scott Jeffreyon because from the hospital over at Maricopa Medical Center, he is conscious, he is alert, and they expect to release Scott Jeffreyon later today and that's the best news that any of us could have hoped for well that's great news because scott jeff runs a great competitor and he was a teammate of mine back in 1999 with the old mopar team so it's uh, great to hear that scott's gonna be okay all right let's talk a little bit about the red lights because we saw three more in this opening round of pro stock as we get one more look at scott heading violently into the wall well you know you can say there was three red lights in pro stock but Two of them, I think, were just basically guesses. You can't really blame it on the LED. Scott Jeffron, maybe, because he was only 5,000 to red, was, where he just barely missed it. But Alan Johnson was 900 to red, and Ron Krischer was almost 300 to red. And I think that's when a driver just goes up there, thinks the light's going to come on right at that point, and he just kind of leaves and doesn't hit it right. So I don't think you can blame... You definitely can't blame all three of those on the LEDs. Well, I know one thing. We've got second round action coming your way up next when we return to Firebird International Raceway in round two of the NHRA Power and Drag Racing Series. Well, I don't care whether it's February, March, April, October, November, it doesn't matter. Whenever John Force races with Bazemore, it is a main event. Going back to last year, it appeared as if Whit Bazemore was going to take a real big swing at Team Castro, but as it stood, only two national event wins, and he finished fifth in the points. It was a terrific run for the championship last year, but this team had nothing to do with it. Now they'll be racing John Force here in Phoenix. We've said it before. We'll say it again. Every time Whit Bazemore races John Force, if he wants John Force to consider him at least his equal, he's got to beat him. Dave? Well, Bill, the other moment of truth for Don Schumacher Racing comes in the form of Gary Selzy, who will take on another one of those John Force cars, Gary Densham. This is a man, though, that one year ago suffered through one of his worst seasons ever in drag racing, but because of this team, headed up, of course, by Don Schumacher, crew chiefed by Mike Neff, they have given him confidence like he has never, ever known before, and he feels like it doesn't matter who's in the other lane. He will come out on top today for Whit Bazemore and... For Gary Selzy, today is indeed a moment of truth. Let's go over to Parker Johnstone. Well, Dave, one of the big matchups in the next round of eliminations in top fuel is between Daryl Russell and Tony Schumacher. Tony Schumacher has seven event wins in his career. Daryl Russell lists five. Tony Schumacher qualified third. Daryl qualified six. Perhaps the most telling statistic, the last nine, nine times these two have met, Tony's won five times to Daryl's four. But the advantage might go to Tony because he is the defending event champion. Until you consider, no top fuel driver has won this race back-to-back -back since 1987. 
Thanks, Parker. It was Dick LaHaye who turned that trick. And there's Tony. He'll be the third pair out when we come back. Take a look at the ladder now. And in round two, Arrow indicates who's got the lane choice. First matchup, a big one. Milliken and Dixon. More on that in a moment. Take a look at the right side. Brandon Bernstein and Tony Schumacher have the lane choice in those matchups. And there is the Miller Lite Top Fueler. Now, these guys have met twice before. Always, Larry has had lane choice. And always, both those times, he has thrashed that man right there. The table has turned, Mike Dunn. Well, you know, Clay Milliken has lane choice, and that car has never looked better. They, ha You know, that's the difference now. The performance of this team is definitely better than it was in the previous times they've matched up. The two champions, Milliken from the IHRA and the NHRA's Larry Dixon. There is Don Perdome. This is a big matchup for Milliken because this is his biggest opportunity to make a statement now. He's finally got the lane choice. If he's going to say, I'm going to be a big-time player, this is it. They have been very good, but not quite able to go over that hump when they've had this matchup until now. You know, and in the offseason, there was a little bit of a wager to one or a, a, a shot that was fired by that Warner Enterprises team for a hundred grand to see who was the overall champion. We heard about that, so uh, this this could be it right here. And here, well, let's talk about deceleration in Top Fuel. Well, you know, as fast as these things accelerate down the track, you want to be able to stop them. Top Fuel Dragster, they have two parachutes. Rear brakes only, which are carbon fiber, activated by a hand, by, by a hand brake handle. They, they're going to achieve about three and a half negative Gs when that parachute hits. And what you want to do is you want to pull the parachute about 100 feet before the finish line, let off the throttle, grab the brake, and then when you feel the chute hit, hopefully about 50 feet past the finish line or 100 feet, let off the brake and then just coast off to the end. There's Larry's performance in round number one. And take a look, the top five... ETs of round number one. Clay Milliken was number four. Larry Dixon not among the top five. Saw a lot of great runs in that first round. A tricky track, but yet a lot of the teams were able to get down the racetrack. The reason Clay Milliken and Larry Dixon are going first is because the slowest guy chooses, or the fastest guy chooses first. They were the slowest of it, so they ended up with what was left over, which was the first pair. Milliken, a 4.59, a good run. It was close, but he still has yet to beat Larry Dixon. Dave? Touche, Dick LaHatt of that right lane, going deep, sucking it up, pulling it out from the gut. Well, I guess that's what you got to do when you're racing these guys, right? You just try to do the best you possibly can and hope he's good enough. Were you worried about that right lane, 53? Not really, no. We tested here. We run good over there. Take another look at this run, and uh, we talked this about this being a statement race, and I think Mr. Dixon made the statement. Obviously, they weren't worried about that right lane to run a 4.53. He had that thing tuned up very aggressive early in the run, 8.35 and 60 feet, 2.14 by the 330-foot mark. They were going for a big number. A little bit overcast out there. Obviously, Dick LaHaye felt that the track was going to be able to hold a big number, and like he's been so many times before, he was dead on right. Let's go to Bill Stevens. 4.53, 3.22, major spankage. Well, they're again, Dick LaHaye, they ain't taking that team lightly. They've been running strong all year. Um, Miller Lightcar got it done. You know, I, I was worried because I got out of the groove towards the top end of the racetrack. It stayed, stayed hooked up, but I know that slows you down. If I could keep it straight, it might run a little bit quicker. Oh, boy, I don't want to be here for that. Well, it did dance a little bit uh, down track, but uh, I don't think Don Perdomo will be beating him up for that one. We go back to the starting line, and you're looking at Brandon Bernstein. You can see he ran a 4.59 in that first round. He'll be over in the left-hand lane. And his reaction time, 0.47. His top speed in that front round, 323 miles an hour. For Jim Head, well, Jim raced uh, Brandon's dad, Kenny, 28 times in both top fuel and funny cars. So now he has the distinction of saying he matched up against both of them. 
And Jim Head with Alan Johnson helping. That car has been progressively getting better and better. But uh, Brandon Bernstein looked very good in the first round. Like you mentioned, that 047 reaction time. That was the second best reaction time in top fuel for the first round. So the kid's definitely got his game on going on today because uh, he looks very good. And that car has just been unbelievably consistent. Jim Head's definitely going to have his work cut out for him. And there is Kenny Bernstein, his wife Cheryl. Cheryl closest to you, Brandon's girlfriend on the far end. as it falls off pace just a little bit, 3.09, but Jim Head was never a factor as uh, he had problems right from the start. Let's check in with Parker. Kenny, it's amazing. It looks like he's driven that car all of his life. Well, thank you. The team's doing a great job making him comfortable, and he is doing a good job, and uh, I guess that's part of the game. Just have to keep making runs, and the more you make, the better you get at it. But I can tell it hurts to watch. <laughs> well, it does. You know that. I think you can say that for yourself. <laughs> But he's doing better this week than he was two weeks ago at Pomona. He was a real basket case then. Stay with us. Back here at the Checker Shucks Craig and Nationals and the electronics leader Sanyo is proud to bring us our aerial pictures from the Sanyo light ship. Sanyo leading the way. Our pilot is Alan Judd, cameraman Mike McClure. Thanks, guys. We can see you up there. I can see you waving, actually. Yeah. Good to have you, as always. And from high above, we go down trackside, and you're on board with the Army of One, the Sarge, Tony Schumacher. Tony's going to be in the left lane, right lane, that man right there, Daryl Russell. And while they back up, let's check in with Bill with Brandon Bernstein. 466, nose over a little. Yeah, it did. Uh, it seemed like, uh, you know, down track, uh, it started spinning a little bit. Uh, as you can see on the tires there, it uh, looked like it got the centers out. But uh, we're, we're happy, you know, this Bud Cars and Lucas Oil Maxwell's cars back in it. You know, we're still uh, we're still fighting, and uh, it'll be a good round next round. I can tell your dad's working with you. Your helmet's coming off a lot faster this race. We're trying. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit of a problem for Bill. He was ready, we were ready, and poor Brandon was trying to unstrap. Take a look. You can see uh, Tony's first round performance. Here's Daryl's E.T. from the opening stanza. He picked up some sponsorship from uh, McDonald's of Scottsdale. There was his reaction time from the opening round. These two drivers have been to the finals of the last three Phoenix races between them. Russell was the runner-up in 2001. He actually beat Tony in the semis of that race that year. Two very good drivers here. I can't help but notice that uh, you know, Dick LaHaye ran that right lane, did have lane choice, runs 453, and then we saw Brandon definitely spin the tires in the middle in that left lane. Very interesting. Bye-bye. And Tony Schumacher goes a 460 flat at 323 and takes another step towards repeating as the winner here at Phoenix. And let's check in with Dave Reed. West Ernie, nice 460, 323 on a board, good enough for lane choice. Stay home over here on the left side. Well, we just needed to win the round. We need to be in the semis, and we're there, so we're happy. Take another look at this run. You're going to see Daryl Russell spin the tires very early in the run. Cost him uh, going into the second round. Tony Schumacher, on the other hand, 460. We saw Brandon spin the tires just before the transition from the concrete to the asphalt. Tony Schumacher, on the other hand, is we're on board. He stuck all the way down there, kept it right in the middle of the group. Nice pass. One more look in slow-mo. You see him launch that front end up in the air a little bit and uh, straight down Broadway. And as uh, we watch the end of this run, we send it down to Bill at the far end with Tony Schumacher. Over hill, over dale. Tony's rumbling in that rail. You like that? Sounds good. Got a nice ring to it. Okay. I changed jobs, man. That's pretty good. Might have. Hey, for the U.S. Army, we got two races going on today. Obviously, me and Jerry Nadu over on the Winston Cup side now. So, making the Army proud. This is what it's all about. We got a lot of soldiers over in Afghanistan and Kuwait doing a great job. Good run, Daryl. And uh, West Cerny's got this thing running on rails. I mean, 59, 60. We need to step it up. But you know what? It's hot out. What a great run. You know, we're proud of those guys working as a great team. That's what it's all about, trying to win this. Looking an awful lot like last year here. 
Thanks, Bill. As uh, we get ready for a matchup with Doug Kalitta and John Smith, and look at reaction times from the opening round. The top five, and Doug Kalitta was the best with that 042. Let's get more from Dave Reed. Yeah, but it's not like they are not nervous about this race because one thing this car knows how to do, and that's make a lot of horsepower. If there's a place that Connie Kalitta, Jim Overhoff, or the crew chiefs on that car are nervous, it's just that car approaches half track. We saw Brandon Bernstein just a pair ago start to smoke the tires, haze them a little bit in the middle of the racetrack, and that's been an Achilles heel for Connie and his crew to see if they can get this thing wheeled back. We'll know if Doug's going to move on to the semifinals about the 660 mark here. Well, I, and I think they remember Memphis last year when that man right there, John Smith, took out Doug Kalitta in an upset. There's wife Rhonda looking on. He is definitely on pace as uh, he'll not have lane choice against Larry Dixon. Dixon's 453 is low for the session, but a very strong run for Doug Coletta. Take a look at the semifinal matchups as uh, it will be Larry Dixon with the lane choice over Doug Coletta in the first of our semifinals by two one hundredths of a second. And then Tony Schumacher by six one hundredths over Brandon Bernstein. When we come back to Phoenix, here at the Checker Shucks, Greg and Nationals. That's right, be time for the floppers. Along with Mike Dunn, Bill Stevens, Dave Reed, Parker Johnstone, I'm Marty Reed. We're so glad you're with us here at Firebird International Raceway. We have had some great racing so far, and we've got more coming your way. Second round of Funny Car as we are getting ready to get back into the war on trackside. Here's the way the matchup will be in round number two. Tony Pedragon, Ron Caps, Bob Gilbertson with the lane choice over Frank Pedragon, then Gary Selzy with the choice over Gary Dencham, and John Force with his old good buddy, with baseball. First up, it will be that man right there, Frank Pedragon in the right lane, and Bob Gilbertson will be over in the left lane. Let's put a period on the top fuel. Doug Coletta is at the top end. Strong 455, but you and Uncle Connie won't get to pick your lane next time. Yeah, you know what? Uh, we'll see how it goes. We ran good in the other lane, uh, the right lane uh, yesterday. So uh, we're looking forward to it and see if we can get by him. Uh, Mac Tools car is running good. You know, champion and uh, all our guys are sporting us today. So uh, hoping to do good. Would that be the 451 in the right lane yesterday? That would be it. Yeah, that 451, a new track record, just in case you weren't with us earlier in the day. Take a look at reaction times of the top five in Funny Car in round number one, and Frank Pedragon, number four in the hit parade. You know, Frank, when he's on, he's a very good driver. You know, the car here, this matchup, and both these cars are capable of running in, in the mid-480 range, but they both kind of lack the consistency to be able to pick, you know, your favorite here. I mean, this could go either way, I think, uh, uh, you know, obviously, if they both hook up, it'll be a good side-by-side -side race. But there's a chance that both could smoke the tires, and it could be a pedal fest, too. But uh, two very good drivers, two very good cars. You're going to have to get her down the racetrack and uh, hope for the best. Red light, Gilbertson. Going to be upset because he could have won the race. Pedragon has problems, gets out of it to a 581. Gilbertson, even though he had more problems at the top end, still runs a 507, but he went red by 1 100th. Bob Gilbertson has been known to take a shot at the tree. He has a lot of 4 0 lights, a lot of 410 lights with the old measurement, but uh, this time he went by, uh, red by a tenth of a second. Obviously, he just took a shot at the tree. Unfortunately for him, like you said, he would have won the race because Frank Pentagon went out there and started spinning the tires. Let's slow these funny cars down, Mike Dunn. Well, pretty much the same thing as a top fuel dragster. You got two brakes, although on a funny car, they have front brakes, usually either aluminum rotors or carbon fiber. They're activated by a hand brake, just like the top fuel dragster, and they'll pull about three and a half G's negative two when that chute hits at over 300 miles per hour. And as we get ready, back at the starting line, there is Gary Densham for Frank Pedragon. He's going to the semifinals now for the first time since Denver last year, and he's done it on two passes, a 504 and a 507. Sometimes I'd rather be lucky than good. 
I've heard many, many drivers say that, including yours truly, at one time or another in their career. All right, we've uh, talked about Team Schumacher and Team Force. Well, guess what? Here comes round two of this weekend, because there is the Oakley time bomb of Gary Selzy in the left lane. from Team Force of Gary Dencham. And a very interesting onlooker is a very close friend of that man right there, Gary Selzy. Danny Lasoski is with Dave Reed. And it doesn't matter, Marty, what discipline you come from. Danny Lasoski, the 2001 World Outlaw Champ, you know that this is a big race. Oh, uh, it's a big race. Uh, Gary's pumped up at Team Oakley, and I think he's got a really good shot at it. His reaction time's been good all day, so I think I'll go down the racetrack really good. And quickly, I hear you're about ready to try this, huh? Yeah, here in a couple weeks, I want to get in a top fuel car. Say, I go far, I go down the track. Him and Tony Stewart. Testing out Tony Schumacher's ride there, Bill. Wow. You know, in the first round, Dale Creasy fell asleep on you, and Bob Gilbertson fouled out, man. You're just intimidating, Frank. <laughs> well, that's what they're trying to squeeze those LED lights, I think. And they're a little more than what people are saying, and, and I don't know. We just want to try to do our own thing, and I'd rather be lucky than good, but uh, that's okay. We're Canyons going to the next round. You were lucky. It just, it just uh, came loose on you. Yeah, I mean, we were just, like I said, it's getting greasy for us. I mean, some guys are getting down there, but we're having a little bit of trouble, but we'll be all right. Okay, we're in the semis. Here you go. Back at the starting line. You can see Jimmy Proc, he's ready with uh, Dencham, and now Lee Beard is finally uh, bringing, or no, I shouldn't say Lee Beard, Mike Neff bringing uh, Gary Selzy into the lights. This is, this is big. I mean, this is what Schumacher invested all this money. He wants to be able to punch out Team Force. A 485 at 319, not good enough. Team Force has now taken out two of the three Schumacher cars. Well, this was a good side-by-side -side race. Gary Selzy had about two hundredths of a second advantage off the starting line, but that Jimmy Proc horsepower just drove right around on the other end. Great matchup. The two young crew chiefs of the future here, Mike Neff and Jimmy Proc, going head-to-head, -head, and they gave us a great drag race. Let's take a look and show you how close it was. About half a car length at the stripe with Gary Dencham taking the win line. Stay with us. We've still got Whit Baysmore and John Force. There's Gary Dencham. We're coming right back to Phoenix. Here's a young fan at round two of the NHRA Powerade Drag Racing Series. And uh, we've got thousands of them here today. And you can get right up very close to the action in the pits. It's one of the great things about the sport. And now trackside, eyes are on the GTX high mileage Mustang of John Force and the Matco Tools Dodge of Whit Baysmore. 41st time that these two have squared off. John holds a huge 32 to eight margin. Last year here at Phoenix, Force and Bazemore met in round number one, and Force, in a hole shot, nipped Bazemore a 484 to a 483. Then in the semifinals, this is John against TJ. Tommy had the race, but then at the strike, coming around after TJ blew the motor, Force won that one as well. You know, Marty, I went mountain biking with Whit Baysmore yesterday morning right here at South Mountain, about 10 minutes from the track, and he remembers last year vividly. He got beat on a hole shot. He was so mad he went on his mountain bike, rode with a friend, and then crashed and hit a tree on his mountain bike. So he definitely remembers what happened here last year, and he doesn't want a repeat of it. He's got a very good car, but he's going to need it against John Forrest. Last year, these guys hooked up five times. John won four of them the breakdown of each driver's performance in the opening stanza. Last chance for Team Schumacher. Lee Beard brings his driver to the line. They can take out the 12-time champ. Schumacher a 504 
scores. John really falls off the pace at 295. Dave Reef. Statement race, statement made. Well, it's uh, fantastic to see that Dodge take that Ford out. You know, uh, we've really worked our tails off over here on Schumacher Racing uh, over the winter, switching to these Dodges, and uh, we're starting to see the rewards of them. We came up with a motto, and that is, to beat the best, you have to be the best. And right now, it will be lane choice going to Gary Densham over with Baysmore. So he gets past one Team Force car. Now he's got to deal with another one. We've got to take commercial breaks. Stay with us and we come back. John Force out of here in round two. Body coming down on Ron Caps' Skull Green. Camaro as he gets ready to go up against number one qualifier, Tony Pedregon. Pedregon's going to choose the right lane. That's where he was in the opening round. And uh, while these guys complete the burnout process, let's go back and take another look at John's run here. You see him getting real close to the center line. That's because he has a cylinder out on the left side of that car, which drives the car over towards the center line and costs him the race. And as we look from the Sanyo light chip, we'll go to the far end of Bill. What was it like inside that car when you hit that strike? Well, you know, uh, you just pray that it doesn't knock the old Goodyears loose and, uh, and that old Johnny boy doesn't come flying around us. But uh, got the half track, I gave a little glance over there. I thought I cut a decent light. But last year, you know, he handed, uh, he, he handed a lot to us. And, uh, you know, it, it's great for Mac Tools team. And, uh, but all, all the real Whit Baysmore fans, and there are some real ones out there, this one's for you because I know you guys love it. Parker. Tony Pendergon's crew chief. John Mevlin made some last minute changes as they pulled up to start. He feels they left a lot on the table after the first run, and they know that Ace McCullough and Ron Caps are gonna throw the kitchen sink at it. And he's afraid that if it holds on, they'll get beat. So he has really got this car hopped up. It's really interesting. Between these two, they've met 26 times. They each won 13, but the last five have all gone to Tony Pedregon. you in the chest said you the man <laughs> well that was a big round for us i mean that tony guy is some they're awesome this year but we've been struggling pretty hard we've been trying to put that number up all weekend and we got it when we needed it thanks john medlin it's the first time this year you've lost back in the staging lanes you said you were going to hop it up you were afraid that these guys if they got away with it would get you and they did yeah they sure did we just left a little too much on the table it's kind of all come down to me and the decisions but we'll be back next week and we'll get them again I admire the way Medlin is trying to take all the blame. I mean, uh, take a look at the incrementals. 485 is nothing to snooze at, but a 483 is just a tick better. Yeah, what a great side-by-side -side race. Tony had a little bit of advantage off the starting line, about 12 thousandths of a second. They both ran identically teeth to the 330 mark. The difference was at half track. Ron Caps ran, started running a little bit faster, 256 miles per hour. To Tony's 253, and that was the difference. Right there at half track, he pulled out there and just held on for the win. There is what it looked like at the stripe. Let's go to Bill. Hammer time. 483 beats a 485. Wow. Really? I tell you this, uh, I don't know what to say because obviously you're used to saying force. You know, he's standing over here and uh, he's always a top dog. He's who you're gunning for. But the last 10 races, I and mean, when you go back last year, Tony Pedregon and that whole team has had the car to beat. No question. But Green Skull guys, we never fret. You got Ace McCall. You, you show up at the track. He reaches in to shake my hand before and says, kick their butts. And uh, when a guy like Ed McCullough tells you that, it was awesome because he got out on, had a fender out, and there's so much going on in your mind. You're, oh, fender's out. Oh, God. Oh, and then the clutch comes in, and he, he goes away a little bit, and then mine put a cylinder out. So then I'm a sitting duck. I'm like, oh, my God, he's coming around me. He runs big speed. But uh, I'll tell you what, Skull guys, Mac Tools, Lucas, one heck of a job. A butt has been kicked. 
Yeah, and there's still some more butt kicking to do. Lane choice going to go to Ron Caps over Frank Pedragon, and then Gary Densham has the choice over Whit Bazemore. When we come back, well, we'll turn our attention to the factory hot rods. That's right, Pro Stock, second round here at Phoenix. Here's the ladder into round two for Pro Stock. Arrow, as always, indicates who's got the lane choice. It is Bruce Allen and Kirk Johnson on the left side of the equation. Jake Coughlin and Greg Anderson over on the right. Let's talk a little bit about decelerating a Pro Stock machine, Mike. Well, the Pro Stock cars have to get stopped, too. It's a little bit different here. They have two parachutes. They have front and rear brakes, carbon fiber on all four co corners. Most of them are foot activated. Now, the, they don't see the deceleration, the G, that the fuel cars do because they don't want the chute to hit too hard because they have not a very much downforce. So, consequently, in the old days, when they ran the big parachute, they'd want to lift the rear of that car up, and sometimes it would pull them into the guardrail. So, they don't, they don't hit, the chutes don't hit quite as hard as the fuel cars, but they still have to get those things stopped quickly. And you're looking on board with Jake Coughlin, the defending champion. Good coming back. Real good. That's his father, Jake Sr., lining him up. A smidge to the tree. I, I need to ask Senior what a smidge is. There is Jay Coughlin Senior. Forward, everything looks really good. Here are the best reaction times. That 006 by the man in the other lane, Jim Yates. Everything's okay. He's going to hope he gets another one this time because obviously Jeggy is consistently the best lever in the business. And this is Jake's 300th round of pro stock competition. You want to talk about a win percentage. He's won 223, lost 76. That's a win ratio of almost 75%. So that pretty much tells you if he qualifies, he's going to be tough to beat in elimination. Who's going in first? The clock's running. It's Jay. At the stripe, Jake Coughlin drives around. 199.73, you got it. Jim Yates beat him off the line by two one hundredths, but Jake drove around him 687 to a 689. Boy, this was a great drag race again. Jim Yates, first off the line, like you said, by about two hundredths of a second. We saw Jackie move a little bit early in the run, lost a little bit of time, but he made it up, and then there comes Jim Yates trying to get around him. The margin of victory just under three thousandths of a second at the finish line. Let's go on board with Jake. Watch how smooth he is. Watch his hands. Jeggy is as good as they come. He worked the wheel a little bit. Not as much as I thought he did on the original shot. Didn't move around quite that much, but man, he is smooth. Want to see what the margin looked like at the finish line? Uh, that's how close it really was. Don't blink. And here comes brother Troy. And he's going to be over in the right lane. Kirk Johnson had the choice. He's going to take the left side. Other than John Force, pretty much everybody that, is, that has had lane choice has chosen that left lane. And we talked about it earlier in the show that, you know, the first, uh, you know, obviously the pro stocks, they feel the bumps in the right-hand lane affect them more, about two to three oh, hundredths of a second. Time. Crew Chief Tommy up, uh, telling him how far to go forward. Want to talk about how tough pro stock is? If you weren't with us earlier today, Briefly. top ten qualifiers broke the old track record. You want to play hardball. This is the division to be in. Red light, Kirk Johnson. In fact, they both went red. And Kirk gives away a 686 at 201. Troy had a 687. Now, what we ought to point out is when both foul, it's ever who was first is worst. So, Kurt at 011 to a 005, and KJ is out of here. We got to take commercial break. Stay with us. We're coming right back.
You're looking at Mark Powick as he backs up the Summit Grand Am here at the Checker Shucks Craig and National second round action of Pro Stock. And this is the first time in over a year that Mark has made it this far in a race. He'll be lined up alongside of Greg Anderson. This is going to be a tough race for Mark Powell. Greg Anderson's looked very good, but Mark Powell has looked good. It's not a surprise that he's, he got his first round win this year because they look good in testing. Bringing on Bob Glenn has definitely helped turn that team around. Bob Glenn is flying the horsepower. Definitely that car looks a hundred times better than it did last year. But Greg Anderson, 684 at 201, beats Mark Powick's 687. And I think Bill's at the far end with, yeah, there's both Coughlin brothers. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with your sets at home. Everything is yellow out here in Phoenix. Jeggy, you got treed and drove around Yates. Yeah, well, you know, that left lane's a little bit better. Uh, certainly, I felt like I hit the tree pretty good, but uh, obviously left on me. Uh, you know, it's a little wake-up call. We got away with it. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be ready to fire here in the semis. And uh, I'm just proud of this whole team. Uh, Troy's team's doing an excellent job. And uh, the whole group's just gelling together. Kurt left on you, too. But luckily, you would have been red. But he was just a little bit too quick. I'll tell you, whatever it takes to win here in NHRA Powerhead Drag Race. And I'll tell you, the whole Jake's team's just extremely excited. And we're ready to rock and roll and get into the semifinals. That's for sure. We're ready. Opposite sides of the ladder. If they win the semis, they'll meet in the finals. And that has happened before. Bruce Allen, as you can see, had the low elapsed time based on speed in uh, pro stock in round number one. Greg Anderson's just matched that here in round number two. B games, tough task here. Bruce has been running really strong this weekend. Almost perfect on the tree. Then he runs a 688, 200 miles an hour, and it was never in doubt. V Gaines is out of here. Bill? Greg, you outrun him. Oh, thank God. It looked like a heck of a drag race. I just peeked over there, and we were door handle to door handle. This Vegas General Construction car is just absolute flight. Flew all weekend. 85, 84, 83, 85, 84. All week, it's like Cadillac to drive. It's just a dream. You just have a ball. Have the adjustments you made on the car been able to jive with the uh, Christmas tree? Yeah, it appears we're about right on sync. Uh, they were just a little too quick last weekend, and we just we tried making a lot of changes, and they weren't right. Uh, thank God the keep three came to us this week, so it seems we're about on schedule. They're dialed in. Well, and I'll tell you, all the changes that they've made over the uh, course of the offseason really paying some dividends. Here's the matchups in Pro Stock semifinals. Troy with the lane choice over Bruce Allen. And it'll be Greg Anderson by three one hundreds with the lane choice over Jag Coughlin. One more man to talk to. That's Bruce Allen. He's with Bill. Hey, you know that BG song, Stand Alive? I'm a few bars. I do know that song, and I'm happy to be doing it. Let me tell you, it's a tough crowd out here, isn't it? No problems at all, though. I mean, the car's dialed in. You've just uh, been uh, putting gas in it. You've been doing a little more than that. It seems like when you're doing good, we were laughing about it. Sometimes when you're running good, you don't really know why necessarily. And consequently, when you're running bad lots of times, you don't know why either. So it's a fine line. Off to the fine, semis. Fine. You don't think these green skull guys are riding high? Just as soon as the car came back to the pits, crew let out a great big yelp, and everybody got going through the motions. That is a quick turnaround here before they head to their semifinals. How about this run? Incredible over Tony. Just enough to nip him at the line, but you can see Ron Cap's already busy at work getting the shoots all taken care of. So big was that round win. All the folks from UST, US Tobacco that is, listening on the internet. Needless to say, the cell phones have been ringing off of the hook. The, everybody's calling to congratulate this team on what they just accomplished. Couple more rounds to go, though. They're staying focused as they head to the semis. Parker? Dave, that celebration over in the Ron Capps pit is probably heightened because I don't think anybody in the funny car pits thought that Tony Pendragon could be beaten. And you haven't been beaten through 2003. You've set records. You've mowed down the competition. Are you stunned? I am. Well, not really. I mean, I, I understand this business um, way too good to, to be disappointed. It's very unpredictable. Um, 
we probably weren't as aggressive, but he came in. Uh, weren't as aggressive as we, we would have liked to have been, but we're coming off of a, an event um, where we had slightly different conditions. So I'm going to remember this little celebration that Caps had the next time we race him. I know John Medlin feels the same way, but the beauty of it is uh, we've got Densham and Triple A still in the, in the race. Uh, our ability to rebound is going to be very important for us. We're going to a fast track in Gainesville, and um, we don't look to repeat this kind of performance. We're probably going to be a little more aggressive, and, and um, that's not good for the competition. So you use the defeat here and the celebration over there to get you and this team pumped up. Well, I, I, unfortunately, I've got a pretty good memory, but it, it's a big win for them. And we didn't take them lightly. We just, um, on the run last night, it was a little on the aggressive side, and we slid the clutch a little bit more in the middle than we probably should have. But you got to remember, this is going to be a long year. Um, I talked about that. We're going to stay humble. Uh, we're going right back to work at Gainesville. High spirits. We're going to keep our chins up. And, and um, next time we run into caps, well, I'm going to hit him on the chin. This team coming back stronger? I think that's unthinkable. And if you remember, it was Dave Reef who was talking about that big celebration just moments ago, and those pits are not that far away from each other. I mean, Ron is known for uh, his big celebrations at the uh, far end. In fact, uh, here he tosses a glove at Whit Bazemore in fun, but uh, I think that's uh, going to be something that those guys will remember, obviously, as uh, we get headed for commercial break. Stay with us. We're coming back to Phoenix here at Firebird International Raceway. First off, we got a five here. souvenir. Check in to the pits with Dave Reef. Well, you might think the Mac Tools guys are breathing a sigh of relief after getting off the schneid as the number one qualifier and getting through a couple of rounds, but I'm down with Connie Kalitta to tell you no, there is nobody taking this next round lightly. You get the big one, Larry Dixon. Yeah, he's, uh, got Dick LaHaye is um, just an awfully good tuner and he knows how to read the track and he comes up with him when he needs him. And uh, so it, uh, and we, we're fortunate, unfortunate, we lost the lane choice. But I don't think it makes that much difference because he just run 453 in the right side. So I'm sure you'll put it over there. Let's add into the fact, too, that we were also looking at your spark plugs. I have no idea what it means, but you told me the car was actually soft up there the last time. And I want to remind you about a 451 you pulled out of the right lane, so you know the car's capable. That's capable, and uh, you know, we're going to be pretty close to that tune-up when we go back up to the start line. It's going to be exciting. This is a proving race indeed for Doug Coletta. Let's head over to Parker. Dave, every crew member on Tony Pendergon's crew is hard at work during the semifinal turnaround. Frank Pendergon, oh man, you can shoot me now or shoot me later. This is a big matchup for you. You went to two semis last year, one at Bandemir, one at Atlanta, and you're up against Ron Caps. You asked me just before we came on, who am I up against? And you were surprised it wasn't your brother Tony. Yeah, the way he's been running lately, I, you know, I thought it'd be him, but hey, it doesn't matter. We'll race anybody. It's We're really racing against the track. We're having a couple of problems now, but we qualified well, and that's good. So hey, we're happy to be in the semifinals. So the competitors, the track is always, but it'd be nice to take down Ron Caps. Marty? Yeah, you got to get those Pedragon boys straight there, Parker. <laughs> They'll gang up on you, all three of them. Hey, take a look at some of the young fans that are here at Phoenix at Firebird International Raceway. And you want to know where downtown Phoenix is? Look, the San Diego Lightship way off into the distance. Along with Mike Dunn, Bill Stevens, Dave Reef, Parker Johnstone, I'm Marty Reed. We're glad you're with us here. Round two of the NHRA Power, a drag racing series. Let's get caught up on top fuel. Here's Bill Stevens. Well, every time Brandon Bernstein gets out of his car, he's quick to thank Tim Richards and tell everybody what a great job the crew is doing. Now, Crew Chief Tim Richards, give me a report card on Brandon Bernstein so far this year. Well, it's nothing but an A+. Plus. Uh, he's, he's a pleasure to work for. Uh, in every respect, he's he's part of our crew, really. He does more than just drive this car. He works on this team hard. And uh, it's our pleasure, really. It's probably the youngest driver you've been with since you tuned for Connie Kalitta back in 1994. Yeah, well, Connie, you know, Connie's birthday is tomorrow. He's 65, and uh, <laughs> this kid's just a little bit younger than that. Just a bit. Let's go to Dave. And let's remember when Larry Dixon was a youngster back in 1995, in his second race ever in the seat of Don Perdum's top fuel car, this man got his first ever top fuel win. Well, now 26 wins later, we're a world champion. But take me back to 1995 and what you remember from that first win, Larry. And I tell you what, it was uh, that whole start of the season. You know, we wrecked a car in testing, and then uh, so I drove Snake's car from the, the final strike season at Winter Nationals. Then we had Coletta. They flew out our brand new Murph car, and we debuted it here. So it was like I was driving three different cars in three different weeks, and it was just a, it was really a blur. And then all of a sudden, it's like the car's running, and we're going rounds, and all of a sudden here we are in the final round. Our car was running good, got the win, and I was just like. 
thank God, you know, like, I mean, you don't have to worry about how long, you know, when are you going to win? When are you going to win? It's like it was done and over with before I could even think about it. So it was, uh, it was a good time. Speaking of Kalita, that's the man he races in the next round. I'd ask him about that, but Larry's just going to go through the motions like he always does. Another big matchup, though, can be found in Pro Stock. Here's Parker. Absolutely, Dave. And Greg Anderson will have his work cut out for him as he faces last year's Pro Stock champion, Jake Coughlin. <laughs> Greg, it appears to me that Pro Stock has come down to a battle at the Christmas tree. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's not necessarily just come down to it. It's just intensified this year with the new lights out there. It's just incredible. Everybody's 4-0 to 420. Everybody. And you've shown that on the opening round at Pomona, you can cut a perfect light. Do you try to anticipate this? No, you can't try and anticipate it or you will go red. It's, it's danger out there right now because the lights are a little quicker. Uh, it's probably going to come down to whoever gets the lowest light without red lighting. It should make for a great race. And don't go anywhere because when we come back, it will be time for Top Fuel semifinals. Kalita, Bernstein, Dixon, Schumacher. Take a look at this crowd at the Checker Shucks Craig and Nationals here at Firebird International Raceway as they are coming to their feet because it's time for Top Fuel semifinals. Will it be Tony Schumacher or Brandon Bernstein, second generation racers? Think about this, almost 30 years to the day, Tony's father, Don Schumacher, raced Kenny Bernstein, Brandon's father, and it was Don winning over KB. It was Kenny Bernstein's first ever final. 1973 winter nationals. He, Kenny Bernstein was driving Ray Alley's engine master's charger. Ray Alley is now the technical director for both top fuel and funny cars. What are the guys calling Nitro police? Uh, nitro <laughs> police. <laughs> he's gonna, if you're cheating, he's going to find you. Take a look at the best of laps times uh, so far, and you can see that Tony Schumacher has the third. Here are the reaction times. Brandon has the second quickest reaction time. Only Doug Kalita has been better. And top speeds, well, Tony Schumacher leads it between the two of them there. And Brandon's reaction time, that was in the first round. Second round, he was a little bit off. He was actually played at a 102 reaction time, which meant he was about a tenth after the light turned green. He's going to have to knock off, cut that in half. He needs to get back to about the an old... 050 again if he wants to be able to lead with Tony Schumacher. Tony's very, very consistent on the lights. Remember, Brandon Bernstein went to the finals of the Budweiser shootout, then was eliminated in first round at Pomona. And here he has his chance to go to his first ever final in only his second race. goes 320 but a 458 and Brandon was first off the line by a hundredth Parker Tim Richards you and Brandon have the makings of a beautiful relationship going on here well he's, he's a good kid you know like <laughs> this is really something he was a crew worker and uh, basically was uh, cleaning parts so this is pretty good to go into that scene congratulations thank you Brandon's father, Kenny, won the first ever top fuel race here back in 1991. Brandon is going to have a chance to join the family tree, so to speak. Great job by Brandon. Like you said, about 7,000 advantage off of the starting line. You see him go through the middle. Right there is where he started pulling away. He was a little bit faster in the middle of the course, 271 to Tony Schumacher's 269. We talk about it all the time. That's where you make the difference. You see a cylinder go out just before the finish line on Brandon's car. Slows him down and still went 320 miles per hour. Looked like he might even put a second one out just before the finish line. We watch him going down the track. Here's where he's making this move on Tony. Right through the middle there. There's a cylinder out on the right-hand side. And there's another one right before the finish line. And still went 320 miles per hour. And let's go to Bill. Your 455 beat the defending event champions 458. And you left on him by a bunch. Oh, well, that's uh, hats off to Tim and the guys. I mean, they did a great job. Hey, good run, guys. Good run. That was uh, that was all them, you know. 55. I mean, we stepped it up there, smoked the tires a little bit, semifinals, and uh, and hats off to Tim and the boys. They did a great job. This uh, this Budweiser car is all. It's going to be awesome. Good final. You know, your dad won his first top fuel race here in '91. Did he really? That's pretty cool. Then maybe we can do it again. Ah, uh, he'd love to do that. A thumbs up from the rookie. Now it's time for the champ and the number one qualifier to square off. Will it be? Doug Coletta. He's only won once from the pole in his career. 
And for Larry Dixon, well, he's looking to go back-to-back -back finals. First two races of the year, remember? He won at Pomona. Dixon has uh, lane choice, decided to go into that left lane. But uh, this right lane, and about, uh, what well, was a little bit later in the day than it was uh, at this time yesterday when he ran that wonderful 4.51 that gave Kalita the track record. You know, this is a great matchup here, but these two cars are, are a little bit different. If you took both these cars, they ran the same elapsed time, of four, like, say, a 4.50. That car right there would make its ET. It would run about 300 quicker to the 300-foot mark. Doug Collette, on the other hand, he would make most of his ET from 300 to 600 feet. He's been running as fast as 277 miles per hour in the eighth mile, but he's made his good run. So even though they can run identical ETs, two different tune-ups on these race cars to get the same result. And I think that one graphic where you saw the top speed so far in top fuel, where you saw Doug Collette at 324. Is Larry Dixon going to his 49th career final? Or is Doug Kalitta going to number 25? Big advantage off the line, but then Kalitta goes up in smoke. And Dixon goes 456 at 325. Brandon Bernstein's going to have lane choice in the final. Dave. And for Dick LaHaye, as ominous as this weekend began, to make it to the finals is quite an accomplishment. Well, that's what we came here for, you know, is to try to win the race. Uh, we just got a heck of a bunch of guys here, you know. And uh, to come back from the adversities that we had in the beginning of the season, or the beginning of the weekend, uh, I'm very pleased with it. And there might be one more adversity, no lane choice, but... Yeah. We've won from the right lane before. We'll see what happens. Boy, I'll tell you what, Kalita had five 100s in the bank, but then went up in smoke. Brandon Bernstein, by one 100th, has the lane choice in top fuel finals. His first ever against a guy who's going for win number 27. Stay with us, funny car, when we come back. Back here at the Checker Shucks Craig and Nationals as we're getting ready for semifinal action in Funny Car. And it's time for our first matchup. Will it be Frank Pedregon or Ron Capps going to the final? For Ron, it would be his 29th. For Frank, it would be his 7th. As they get ready to do the burnout. The four drivers left in Funny Car have never won here at Phoenix. In fact, the furthest anybody went was Ron Capps. He's been to the finals just once. You know, if you look at on paper, Ron Capps would rate a, a pretty good advantage over Frank Petragon. Frank hasn't been able to get down the racetrack here very well on race day. He ran a 504 in the first round, spinning the tires down track, then came back and spun the tires early, but got that break when uh, Bob Gilbertson red-lighted. But you got to remember one thing. I mean, he's got Jim Dunn as his crew chief. I'm kind of familiar with him. I know how he operates it. He's very good at being able to put everything together. And Ed McCullough, who is crew chief for, you know, Ron Capps, those two have raced together a number of times. I'm talking Jim Dunn and, and Ed McCullough. Ed McCullough knows what Jim Dunn's capable of, and he, I can assure you he is not taking him lightly. These two have met a total of ten times. They've each won five, so they know each other well. And Always been uh, pretty much even up. Nobody's ever jumped out to a big, huge margin. In fact, Frankie won the last time. It was uh, Atlanta 2001, back when he was racing for Dell Worship. saw it, Ron Capps, a 484 at 319. Frank Pedragon Hayes, the tires, and so uh, the clock struck 12 for Cinderella, Dave Reef. Nicely done, he's got the car on repeat now in the low 480s. Well, we're pretty lucky out here today. I mean, the, the clouds have sort of blown in here a little bit. It's keeping the track real nice. Uh, you know, we'll just get this round and uh, see who we got next. It's Caps and now two Pedregons put on the trailer today. And you saw the teammates from Don Perdome Racing uh, celebrating. Let's go to Bill. And too bad that extra 25 pounds has been slowing you down so much today. 
<laughs> well, you know what? We just got to go out there, uh, you know, got to do whatever we got, whether it's to get by the scales or to keep the, the car hooked up or whatever. Uh, you know, we've been running 50s all day, and, and that's uh, that's pretty good. I'm uh, pretty happy with the Miller Lite team. You know, it's a, another big round. And... How about uh, this guy, man? Love is grand. <laughs> yeah, we've got two snake cars in the final round, that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, it could happen. Uh, double for the snake before the day's over. And there is Ron Caps. We'll talk to him in a moment. Take a look at the run. This was a nice run. Ron Caps had about one hundredth of a second advantage off the starting line. Nice and clean right down the middle of the course. No drop cylinders like we've seen in the first run. That's what you need to do. 484, that's a great run. Let's look at it in slow motion. Not too much wrong with this pass. No tire shake right through that transition there and then just starts charging through the middle and makes a great run. And let's go back to Bill. Man. Case found it. Whatever it was, he's got it. It's in his pocket. He's using it. We've been trying to find it, and it's, you know, it's been there all weekend. Just, it was a bracket car, <laughs> 488. Mike Dunnick explained it what a bracket car is, but I'll tell you, it's, <sighs> I, I'm backing up from burnout. Up on the Winston Vision in front of me, or the, the Motel 6 Vision, I'm sorry. We're backing up, and there's Dixie being interviewed, and I'm thinking, what a deal. Can I just get in the final, give Snake another shot at a double? And uh, you get this close, and you wonder, you know, just come on. Let's just finish the job. And uh, school guys, you're talking about a pinch a pinch better. Uh, that race against Tony Pedregon was like that. It was a pinch. I didn't know about Frank. You never know what they're going to do. But uh, school guys, I'm a team winner green. We're doing a great job. Been a long stretch since Ron Caps won his last race. Yeah, let's get ready for the next one. Whit Bazemore and Gary Dencham. And there is Gary. Uh, you know, these guys uh, raced at the final back at Bristol last year. Witt won that one. He also won Atlanta the week after that. And you can see that uh, Gary has a low ET so far of Funny Car. That set last round. Great matchup here. You know, Jimmy Brock uh, is not afraid to get after the race car on this racetrack with uh, his driver, Gary Dinsham. The Lee Beard, he's a little more calculating. I mean, he'll calculate what the racetrack is and, and try to run the best run. Jimmy Proc, he'll gamble a little bit more, but he's very, very savvy. He knows how to make horsepower. He knows how to get it down the racetrack. Years of experience for, for the age that's uh, for as young as he is. But well, we noticed uh, on that uh, graphic, it was uh, Lee Beard's car that had top speed so far at 319. So this is a pretty even matchup, and we've been talking about Team Schumacher versus Team Force. And here they are, side by side, another time. Yeah, this is a great matchup, Marty. It's going to be Gary Detchum, 483 at 316. You saw Bazemore hike the front end and drift a little left. He runs a 497 at 309, Dave Reef. Another nice, solid, clean pass out of the right lane. Love it. Yeah, it was. You know, we we, had, we struggled a little in qualifying, but uh, everybody worked hard, and uh, we put our heads together, and we got her straightened out. And uh, I got to thank all the guys for the help back in the pits. We had a little bit of a thrash, but they obviously fixed her. It's Tony Pedregon in Pomona, and watch out for Gary Dent from here. Going to his 13th career final, looking for win number five. Identical reaction times, but you saw Whit Baysmore get out of the groove towards the wall. That cost him. I think he might have even had to backpedal the throttle. He only was going 220 miles per hour at the eighth. Oh, you see it? There's a cylinder out over it, over on the left side of the car. That's what pushed it over towards the wall. I didn't see that on from the from the blimp, but uh, that definitely cost him the run. Let's go to Bill. Gary Densham. Time after time after time, we've seen it. Just when it looks like another team is going to come up and hurt you guys, either you or Tony or the big man himself, John Force, somehow, some way, come up with the run that you need. Well, I tell you, I mean, you know, we had a big panic back there to change the can, and I was in the car, had to tow it all the way from the pits back up there from the trailer. And, but, you know, my guys do a great job. Jimmy Brock, the whole team, the crew, John Force racing, you know, you couldn't ask for a better group of guys. And, you know, get in there, you're confident it's going to be okay. And it made it, I mean, it made it almost that far. But, hey, we got the win. That's all that counts. Jimmy Proc doesn't get a lot of headlines, but I'm here to tell you he is the real deal. What a tune. Yeah, and he's got his car lane choice, courtesy of a 483 to the 484 for Ron Caps. Hey, let's check in with the debrief on a great program.
Oh, no, no, no. Kurt Johnson's team has not grown. What you are looking at, though, are eight of the ten Western Region semifinalists from the AC Delco Tech of the Millennium Contest. It's a contest that started last October with 2,400 technicians across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico taking written tests. And from there, the semifinalists begin gathering here in Phoenix. Where they were each assigned an identically prepared Buick Century, which they had to diagnose repair in two hours. The ultimate winner from the weekend, well, you're looking at him. It's Rick Kelly there with the goatee. He's heading to the national championships at the AC Delco Las Vegas Nationals, where the ultimate winner will earn a sitting down $200,000, which, as Warren Johnson notes, is the same amount this year's Pro Stock champion will earn. Nice stuff. And congratulations to all those guys. Job well done. Hey, it's time for Pro Stock, the semifinals, when we come back to Phoenix. Back here at the Checker Shucks, Craig and Nationals, round two of the NHRA Powerade Drag Racing Series. And from the far end of the racetrack, time for Pro Stock. And there is Troy Coughlin. He's going to be over in the left lane, up against number one qualifier, Bruce Allen. Now, uh, Troy has the lane choice, went over into the left lane. Here is uh, the reaction times. Look at some of these numbers. Now, we have had four fouls, which, of course, is going to keep the Pro Stock guys chattering. Well, I don't take much to keep them guys chattering anyway, but uh, they always seem to have something to complain about. But Bruce Allen, I'll tell you what, I mean, he looked very, very good up until the last round. The car definitely fell off any lap time. That's why he lost lane choice. Up until that point, I mean, he was definitely the car to beat pretty much in qualifying and the first round eliminations. It looked very, very good. But uh, I, I'm kind of concerned at what happened to it uh, the previous round to make it fall off to where he did lose lane choice. There you see uh, where Troy, he actually uh, double fouled with Kurt, but Kurt was first. First is worst, and that's why Troy's here, and Kurt's on the trailer heading home. Looking to go to his 11th final, Bruce Allen. It could be his 39th. His first ever final was all the way back in 1985. is the fact that Brother Jag is coming up next. A 685 to a 687. And actually, Bruce left on him at the start. You could see it. Yeah, he had about a hundredth of a second right off the starting line. But for some reason, Bruce Allen lost his power that he had in earlier rounds in qualifying. And Troy Coughlin was able to drive around him on the other end for the win. In fact, at 60 foot, you can see Bruce Allen was in the lead. But from half track to the stripe, it was all Troy Coughlin. So it means now that all three of our defending event winners are gone. And that is the Jags team celebrating a win. Time now to find out if Brother Jags gonna make it into the final as well. He's gonna be over in the right lane because Greg Anderson had lane choice and he is gone into that preferred left side. All the pro side guys are definitely taking that left lane because of the bumps down track, but uh, you can still win from that right lane. If anybody can do it, I think it'd be Jed Coughlin. Greg's last final, Brainerd, when he lost to the guy in the other lane, Jake Coughlin. Look at this! Two great lights. The wind light at the strike, Greg Anderson. 685, 201 to a 687 at 200. Gave it a shot. Jaggy left with an 010 to an 017. Well, this was a great race for about 400 feet. 7,000 difference on the light. Both drivers had excellent reaction times. Both had 101 and 60 feet. They were even about 330 feet, same time. And then the difference was Greg Anderson from 330 to six to the 660. That's where he pulled him and was running about a mile an hour faster at half track. That made the difference at the finish line. As you watch this race from the Sanyo Lightship, Greg Anderson is going to have lane choice by one one thousand of a second as we go on board with Jake one more time as he goes through the gears. It was hot, straight, and normal, but there you can see the nose of Greg's car. Let's go to Bill. It's up to you, brother. I'll tell you what, Team Jake's couldn't be more proud of all of us. Oh, the whole entire team's done a hell of a job to get these two yellow and black cars into the semifinals and one of them into the finals to hopefully uh, jump into the checkers. We couldn't be more excited. 
This guy over here was in a heck of a points race with Jed Coughlin last year. A little frontier justice just then, but <laughs> now look who you got. We had some real good races last year, but I think he got the best of me, most of them. Uh, hopefully this year is going to be different. Man, I cannot say enough about this car. This Grand Pontiac Grand M is brand new. It's the second race on it. It's absolutely flawless. The best car I ever had. Uh, Ken Black, thank you so much. And all my guys, guys at the engine shop, the guys out here, you're doing just a fantastic job. This is great. At an 010 light. It was very, very good. Take a look at the matchup, and you can see there it is. One one thousandth of a second. Greg Anderson has lane choice over Troy Coughlin. Let's check in with Dave Reeves. Down in the pit of the 2002 NHRA Powerade Champion, Larry Dixon, where what is going on? Pretty much nothing. Nothing we haven't seen before. This team is quietly going about their business, much like they did all throughout 2001 when they came up in the runner-up spot. Just like they did in 2002, there is no pressure, no panic, no fear of anything going on over here as they have just completed a motor change for no reason, just because they're going to the final. It's time for a new block. Dick LaHaye, Donnie Bender talking things over up inside right now. Larry Dixon doing his normal deal, putting in the shoot as they approach this first-time matchup with Brandon Bernstein. Well, like they've raced that red car a few hundred times before, Parker. Dave, the atmosphere is very much the same over here in Brandon Bernstein's pits. He's headed for his first career final in only his second top fuel start. Of course, he's got a great crew, great equipment, but what I find so impressive is how much maturity is displayed behind the wheel. You would have thought he had done this all of his life. It's most impressive considering he has very little time in this car and he hasn't driven in competition for over a year and a half. Could today be his first top fuel victory? I think he's ready and this crew certainly is ready to support him in that endeavor. Marty? Thanks, guys. Yep, another battle of the beer wagons and top fuel. Stay with us. We're coming back to Phoenix in round two of the NHRA Power and Drag Racing Series. Let's face it, drag racing is all about momentum, and that's something that Ron Capps and his Green Skull team hasn't enjoyed much of. The last time this squad went to back-to-back semifinals was from Columbus and St. Louis a year ago, Columbus being the last time this team has won. But to show you how important momentum can be, let's go back to 1998 when they won the first race of the year. That momentum carried them on to five more wins and a runner-up spot in the points to John Force. Indeed, this race has a lot of momentum potentiality, too. Should Ron Capps win and give Larry Dixon the chance to double up for Dom Perdome, the biggest piece of momentum might come from the fact that should they win, they will take the points lead onto Gainesville, and that is very, very big indeed. Parker? Dave, the pit action over in Gary Denson's neck of the woods can best be described as frantic. During that last run, Gary banged the blower. It damaged the bodywork. Crewmen had to take pieces off the body they were running and transfer it over to the body that they will run. In the meantime, crewmen from Tony Pendergon and John Force's crew have come over to help in this turnaround. They're not thinking about momentum. They're just thinking about getting this car ready to be there when the finals start. Let's change gears. Going over to Pro Stock and Bill Stevens. With Greg Anderson, who's supervising preparations on his car for this final round, and you'll take a look at Greg's crew, and you'll see some new faces. Remember last year when he had Mike Stryker and Pat Barrett on the offseason and left the team? He's got Rob Downing over to the right here, former crew chief for Mark Powell. The guy inside the car is Jeff Burley. He's worked with Kurt Johnson. But notice this gentleman right here. This is Jason Lyon. In 1993, he was the NHRA Stock Eliminator Champion. He also works in Joe Gibbs' Winston Cup shop for Bobby Labonte. And later on this year, you may see him in a second Greg Anderson fielded Pontiac here in Pro Stock. All right, thanks, guys. And uh, the one guy that sort of got overlooked in this mix was that at number two qualifier in Funny Car, and here he is into the final, Gary Dencham. Well, you know, Gary Ditchum, he's always kind of like the stepchild of force racing. You know, you're always talking about Tony and John. And, but every once in a while, uh, more often than not, Gary Ditchum's in there running awfully good like he is today. Jimmy Prock has really got a handle on this racetrack and this race car. He has been having some engine damage at the end of the runs, but he's been running some great numbers, and hopefully they can continue that and, and get a win here this, uh, this afternoon. Well, we're going to find out because it's time for the finals when we come back. And all three of our professional categories must shake the earth. Here at Phoenix. Along with Mike Dunn, Bill Stevens, Dave Reef, and Parker Johnstone, I'm Marty Reed, and you're looking down at Firebird International Raceway from the Sanyo Lightship as we are getting ready for the finals. First up, it will be Pro Stock. 
will it be? Troy Coughlin going for his third ever national event victory, or will it be Greg Anderson picking up win number five? Lane choice goes to Greg Anderson by one one thousandth of a second. He's going to take the preferred left side. Parker, what about uh, the track conditions? Big change, Marty. An overcast has come over the area, reducing the outside air temperature. The track temperature has dropped almost 13 degrees since the semifinals. It's gone from 103 to 91 degrees, but the track is still holding some heat. It could cool down substantially in just the next few minutes. And as uh, the burnouts are completed, here are the best elapsed times of the day. Greg Anderson has the second, Troy the third. First time these guys have ever met head-to-head -head in a final. Last win for Greg was back in 2002 at Columbus, and last year at Topeka was Troy's last victory. Well, good, good matchup based on those numbers, but uh, going back to what Parker said, the cooler conditions, they have to make some adjustments here. Normally what they do, the track cools off, the rubber gets tighter. That means you don't get the tire spin that you need to, to lead the starting line, and sometimes you can go into tire shape. So what they want to do is they want to put a little more clutch into this thing, get that tire moving fast enough, get that car accelerating down the racetrack. Hopefully they don't want they don't want to miss that and leave a couple hundredths of a second on the table. There is uh, Greg's wife and the rest of the team getting ready for this showdown. Talking about starting line advantage, it would be probably you'd have to give it to Greg Anderson. Yeah, Greg's very, very good on the lights, and he's been good today, although he's a little, little more inconsistent. I have to probably put that towards the LED, just trying to get a handle on that. But the key here is going to be in the first 60 feet, how they leave the starting line as far as off the, the reaction time and how that car reacts in the first 60 feet as far as the wheel speed they're going to get early in the run because of the changing track conditions from the previous round. Cars pre-staged, time to decide it, round two. And Greg Anderson, look at Kim. <laughs> 690 at 200. Parker, she hugged you too? No, I wasn't that fortunate, but Rob Downing, he made the move from Mark Powick's over to Greg Anderson's. Two races in the season, win number one. Congratulations. It's been great. Thanks a lot, Parker. It's, uh, it's been a great year for us so far. We started out uh, kind of behind the eight ball with a uh, new car, new crew, but uh, I can't say enough for everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the guys back at the engine shop and uh, say special thanks to uh, Pontiac, Mac Tools, and uh, all the workers at Vegas General Construction. Thank you. Congratulations, Marty. It sure didn't take them long to get up to speed. Well, and maybe Rob will give you a hug. Let's take a look as uh, we go back from uh, way up high in the sky. Well, you saw it early in the run. Troy Coughlin got her a little bit sideways. The car started to make a little bit move towards the center and then back towards the wall. That's where he lost it. That allowed Greg Anderson to pull away by a couple of hundredths of a second because both, basically both cars left identically. Here's the way it shaped up, as uh, you can see, Troy at 60 foot was in the lead, but from half track on to the finish, all Greg Anderson. Let's go to the far end to Bill. <laughs> Four runs today, all within a couple of hundredths of each other. It uh, looked like an instant replay every time he came to the starting line. The car's just on autopilot. I have never, ever ridden a car so smooth. It's, uh, it hardly needs a driver. I cannot say enough about my guys. God, what a job they've done. And his Pontiac Grand Am. It's going to be awesome. I can't believe it. Dave's with Troy. Troy looked like the car got moving around pretty good up there in the top end and uh, just ate up a few hundreds. Yeah, it, it did a little bit, but we had to get after a little bit to, to be competitive. And uh, and then to get down and run that good in that lane, I think that's a pretty good job by Team Jags and, and giving it the best effort that we could. So we'll be ready for Gainesville. And Greg Anderson takes over the points lead. What about funny car? Well, will it be Ron Caps? In the Skull Green Camaro, or 57-year-old Gary Dencham in the AAA Mustang. And there is Gary as the body comes down. You know, Gary uh, never been in the finals here before. For Caps, this will be his third final at Phoenix. He was runner-up to Chuck Gensels in 98 and then John Morse back in 2000. Now complete. Take a look at elapsed times. Gary Dencham has low 
so far for the day back in round number two. Caps has the fourth best three and eight last time. And Gary Dinsham and Jimmy Prox staying in that right hand lane. The only team that has chosen that that has had lane choice and they do have lane choice in the final by a hundredth of a second. Their 483 was a little bit quicker than Ron Cap's 484. So both cars you know, are in the lanes that they prefer. So there's no excuses there as far as uh, lane choice for this particular run. You know, guys, I think it's absolutely astounding that Gary Densham is in this final round. We have said absolutely nothing about him this year. All the focus has been on Tony. Cause John Force every time he shows up at the track, we have to include him and in, in whatever the storyline is. But look at Gary Densham after the other two cars and Team Castrol fall by the wayside. He's the guy still holding the torch. And Jimmy Proc brings him to the line. Here are the wins by lane. Right lane, six of them. Left lane, eight. It looks like your funny car program is now on the right track. Yeah, the, the whole school team, you know, uh, Ace, uh, Mike Green now over here. Uh, it's been, they, they work really hard at it. You know, we've been getting tired of getting beat up, so I think we're going to have a good year this year. And now he's looking for a double, guys. Well, and remember, Caps lost on a whole shot in the semifinals back at Pomona, so uh, the guns are blazing as uh, he redeems himself here in the finals and takes the win, which now ties him with... Raymond Beetle on the blue, Max, and Chuck Edgels with 13, and take a look at the margin, almost a car length. Boy, from up top, you'll run cap. I had to look at the tree to make sure he didn't red light because he cut her that close. You see him getting a little bit out of the groove towards the end, but he had enough of a lead over Gary Dinsham that Gary Dinsham just could not get around him on the top end. A little bit of piston smoke there on the other end, but the snake, he's not going to be worried about that because he got the trophy and the check. And we're going to be talking to the new points leader, Ron Caps. Bill. Ron, counting your brief career in top fuel, you now have 14 national event wins. And let me tell you something. I have never seen one so spectacular. You had a 003 light. Your 486 beat his 481. Wow. I'm not going to lie. Some of these guys get cut those lights out here, and uh, you know, they say you do it on purpose. Mike Dunn will tell you you can't do it. It was, it was time to go for me. My foot and my brain said... Come on, Ron, it's time to go, and the light came on, and uh, we almost got lucky. You know, we'll take it. We had some close races. We earned our, our way into the final, and uh, Dempson did that to me in Chicago last year, and it burned me for about three months because I knew he did the same thing, and he guessed, and that pissed me off because I knew that uh, we could have won the round, and Snake, uh, Snake and I had a big talk about it. But uh, this is for Murray, the guys at school. We're going to – I think we took the points lead. We're going in. The whole school – Brigade is coming down, all the corporate people to Gainesville, we're going to have the points lead, that's huge. Mac Tools, Lucas, Champion Spark Plugs, all the people, Oakley. I'm telling you, this is uh, what a way to start the year. Let's go to Dave. Gary Dinsham, a great 481, but not much you can do with an 03 light. A lot of green out the window there, but you were eating them up. Yeah, I know. It's uh, you know, I had the best car day. We should have won. I had a great team out there. Jimmy Proc, John Force Racing, Auto Club, Castro, all the guys. Uh, I guess I let them down. What can I say? We'll get them next time. Just ran out of real estate. Time now for our final race of the day. Top fuel will be Brandon Bernstein picking up his first win and only a second race or the champ, Larry Dixon, going for number 27. And now Snake Racing. If that man can win, Snake, Don Perdome would have their fourth double. It's always been with Ron Capps and Funny Car and Larry back in 2002 at Columbus, 2001 at Brainerd, and 98 at the Winter Nationals. Now, let's talk a little bit about Brandon. Take a look. Kenny Bernstein, 975 rounds of competition in Funny Car and Top Fuel, about 244 miles. Brandon's gone four rounds so far, about a mile. 
And let me tell you what that experience does. Brandon has had some very good reaction times, but he also had a little miscue in the second round. He doesn't have the consistency that Larry Dixon has, and that's where experience comes in. Brandon obviously has very quick reaction times because he can more than often get a good light, you know, get a good jump off the starting line. But that experience is what keeps him calm and keeps him consistent, and that's what he's gonna have to overcome with Larry. Now, Larry, on the other hand, he hasn't had the kind of lights he's had last year. He, even with the LED, his lights are about the same or maybe even a little bit slower than they were last year. And I'm sure he's aware of that, so he's, it'll be interesting to see what he does. Normally, Dick LaHaye will not let Larry Dixon stage deep by that, you know, pushing and putting that car in a little bit closer to the starting line to get a better reaction time number. But in the final round, Dick LaHaye has told Larry Dixon, you can do whatever you want. Time to find out as the battle of the beer wagons is at it again. Just a different driver in the red car on the right. times in top fuel what's it feel like to watch your son get number one well we're real proud of him obviously i mean he did a great job the team tim richards the whole bud team lucas mack i mean i can't say enough the fans but brandon did a good job he probably almost messed up there he deep staged this tree and you don't want to do that but he got away with it and i guess that's love how nervous were you as that run progressed i had a little nervous before you know uh just because you're on the outside looking in i never was nervous in the car but uh you know, you just want to do the best you can. He did a great job and uh, got away with one right there, I think. But that's what it's all about. Congratulations. Thanks, man. The last time Larry Dixon lost on a whole shot, Houston, 2001. Well, it, it happened again. He was, you know, deep state, random first. You know, that probably took about four or five hundreds off of his, his elapsed time. So that run was actually about a 453 had he not staged deep. But he needed to stage deep to get that whole shot to get the win. I'm surprised you didn't say in 2001, guess who was in the other lane when Dixon lost in that whole shot? A guy by the name of Mike Dunn. Let's go to Bill. It was 12 years ago that your dad won his first top fuel national event on this very racetrack, Brandon. And you had him nervous when you staged deep. Yeah, I had me nervous too, just a little bit. So, um, but I know I just told myself, you know, stay calm. You're in deep. Just, you know, see the yellow. Just see the yellow, and you'll be fine. You know, everything will just be fine. Just make sure you stay focused like that, and uh, you'll be okay. And hats off to Tim and the boys. They did an awesome job this weekend. I mean, this car just flew. Everyone down the track, just 50s like crazy, and it was a, it was awesome. It was just great. And thanks for Budweiser, Mac Tools, Lucas Oil Products. We love you all, man. We really do. Our friends at Downtown Harley Davidson, Seattle's here. And it's cool. Thanks, man. The new generation has arrived. And there is a very frustrated Larry Dixon. He still holds the points lead by a 58. There was the margin of win, and the celebrations are beginning. We'll come back and wrap it up in the Phoenix. Larry margin of victory, 23,000. And I think it was you, the very first one to say that Kenny Bernstein's not going away. He's just replacing his driver, and you were right. No, I mean, it's uh, credit to them. You know, we had the better car, but they had the better driver. Um, disappointing. I mean, as a driver, you never want to lose on a whole shot. You want to win ones on whole shots. He got it done. I didn't, and I'm sorry for uh, Miller Lite, Mac Tools, Lucas. You know, uh, we had the car, but not the driver this time. I think Larry's being a little harder on himself. Remember, he was deep staged with Brandon Burstyn. Brandon, very, very deep. Second year in a row, however, that he's lost in the final. For Mike Dunn, Bill Whoa. Stevens, Dave Reed, Parker Johnstone, I'm Marty Reed. RPM Tonight with John Kernan is coming up next. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com. We'll see you in Gainesville, everybody.